going to ask you to stand if you would, and you can either turn to Acts chapter 17, or you can look to the screens, but we're going to pick it up where we left off last time in our study, Acts chapter 17. I'll begin reading in verse 16, if you'll pick it up in verse 17. Again, New King James Version on the screens, if you would, Acts chapter 17. We're looking at our series tonight, uh, Theology and Me, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit and uh, much needed, much needed teaching for us this evening. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? (laughs) And others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Did the word Areopagus mess you up? (laughs) For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. (laughs) It's called gossip. That's a funny verse. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Verse 28, we'll end here. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us tonight. We pray, Lord God, through the worship and through our time together and the worship of you in the word, that you would draw us closer and pull us, Lord, into you. We submit ourselves to you gladly, Jesus. In your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. 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 You can be seated, church. And as I mentioned last time, Theology and Me is the topic that we've been going in our Why series on these Wednesday nights. And we started looking at last time, and we'll finish off tonight, Theology and Me and how that all works. That the fact that theology, of course, really means theo, God, uh, ology, the words, or the words or the study of God. Theology. Big word, but that's simply what it means. What does the Bible say about who God is? And you read a moment ago that uh, it's announced in the scriptures that he is near to all of us. And that is true. Tonight you can be uh, so distant from God and, and a non-believer. You can be an atheist and, and, and you can, or an agnostic and you can be pushing God off. The God that you don't believe in, you're fighting against, which always cracks me up, but you're pushing him off saying you don't believe him, but you're constantly battling with the idea of him, and maybe he does exist, and even in that, God is near you, because he's reaching out to you, and he's drawing you, and he does that by the Holy Spirit. And for us who are believers, the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, both, listen, both in us and upon us in life. For the unbeliever, the Holy Spirit is alongside them, convicting them and pointing out the error of their ways, 
with hopes that they'll repent of their sin, right? And call out to him and receive his mercy and forgiveness. But when we talk about theology, it would be horrific if we studied all about God and never came to know God. I've shared with you before that I have friends who have gone to seminaries and Christian universities and have had unbelieving professors. And the unbelieving professors announce that they're unbelievers in the Christian university. And they tell the students on the first day, I'm a good teacher, I'm not a believer. That's why I was hired by this school. So don't witness to me, I don't need to hear it, I could preach it myself. So open up, let's, let's study Isaiah, and they open it up, and it's like, are you kidding me? You can be a theologian and not be saved. You can be a Christian and not be saved. I'm, I'm reading the life of George Whitfield. It's an awesome book, incredible book. Did you know that man was schooled in theology? He was a trained minister of the Church of England, and he was ordained into the ministry. He was preaching Christ, and people were getting saved. And George Whitfield tells you later on that he wasn't saved himself. And he wound up bowing his knee to Christ well into the ministry life, the great George Whitfield. Isn't that crazy? Does it seem nuts? But it's possible. Well, the thing that sets us, or I should say the one that sets us apart from this world, is none other than the work of the Holy Spirit. And when we look at this, and I mentioned it last time, I want to say it again, from Acts chapter 17, verse 28, when we looked at, for in him we live, we move, and have our being, those three dynamics, we saw that the the New Testament church has a lofty place in the work of God because the Old Testament economy church, you know that the Holy Spirit came upon the Old Testament prophets and then left them. I don't know if you know that or not, but the Holy Spirit never indwelt the Old Testament believers. That never happened, including David, including Abraham. The Holy Spirit came upon them. In fact, you know the song, which is from the psalm. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Did you know that's Old Testament theology? It's not New Testament theology. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit cannot leave you. He will never take his Holy Spirit from you. The Holy Spirit has been commissioned at your salvation. The Holy Spirit came into your life never to leave. He can't leave. He's bound by the words of Jesus. I'm sure many days he feels like leaving, (laughs) but he can't leave. His job, if I can put it that way, is to get you into the presence of Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, and he uses the Bible. The more you have of your word or his word in you, the greater the work the Holy Spirit in your life. And we saw this. We saw that theology in me means that we walk in the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. And there's two great contrasts of life regarding walking in the Spirit. That we who are Christians are called by God to walk in the Spirit. And I did a little reenactment about walking in the Spirit. If you remember, I I read a verse of the Bible and then I prayed that as I moved back and forth on the screen or on the stage, I should say. And that this this is what it means to walk in the Spirit to moment by moment practice his presence, to be uh, having his word, memorizing his word, uh, living his word. God does that. The other day, Monday, I went to Albertson Supermarket to get something poorly, so you need to pray for her. She sent me to get something like uh, almond milk and bread. It was almond milk and bread. And about an hour and 20 minutes later, I got home. (laughs) Why? Because a young man, I think his name was Robert, working at the store, uh, recognized me even though I was masked up because you can't go in. I don't wear a mask, but I have to put a mask on to go in the grocery store. And so I put the mask on, so I thought I'm kind of undercover, and I got the mask on, and this guy, this guy working there says, Pastor Jack, can I ask you a question? And so that thought was a great moment to take off the mask right then and there. And uh, he said, um, I think God is stirring me up because I'm just terribly disgusted with how I live my life. And I don't want to live my life anymore like this. And I need to change. I couldn't believe it. It's like, somebody get a net. This guy's going to jump in. The fishing is great at Albertsons. And um, 
And it's remarkable. And I was able just to share with him right then and there. Why? What's going on? The Holy Spirit had been working in his life. And he was sick of the life that he was living. And he wants to live a life of walking in the Spirit. And this is what the Bible says about that. In Galatians 5, verse 22, it says that, but the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, we talked on this last time. That the fruit of the Spirit, that singular, is love. That's it. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's technically not all those other wonderful things that follow love. The fruit of the Spirit, singular, is love. And from love comes all of the other beautiful attributes of the love of God in your life. Joy. Joy. You can't have joy unless you have the love of God in your life. There's just no way. The world works on happiness, and that's a tough one. Because happiness is based on happenstance. That's where it comes from. You have a happy day? Okay, I did not have a happy day until I got that phone call I told you about. But then I had to go right back to my unhappy day. But in, through the midst of the incredible unhappy day, I had joy. Joy doesn't change. It's not based upon what's going on. It's constant because it's in him. And it's a result of God's love in your life. Peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. Self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires or its desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Why is that important? Because if you go up a little bit in chapter 5, this is what it will spare you from. This is what walking in the Spirit will spare you from. Verse 19. Now the works, notice it's plural, the works of the flesh are evident. It means they're clearly seen. Here's the thing. When you were doing those things I'm about to read here in your old life, you didn't think any of those things were seen. You thought they were clearly veiled and hidden by you and me in our cleverness. When we lived in the world, we, we practiced sin, but we, we, we hid it. The thing is, God sees it all. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. So this is how you combat, or this is how you, this is how you come out of, I should say, uh, a life that is lived without the Lord, is we are bent on sexual immorality. It's human nature. We, we, listen, we, we're born into this world with that appetite. Impurity. Sensuality. Idolatry. Worship of things. Sorcery, Greek word, pharmakai. Uh, the word means hallucinogenic drugs. Isn't that weird? It doesn't mean Mickey Mouse with the hat with the crescent on it and makes him potions. No, it, it means that you enter into a world that, that unlocks the door into spiritual realms. Hallucinogenic drugs will do that. Ter terrifying, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revelries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I want, uh, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom or will go to heaven. Why? Because he just described how the world lives. And I think it's safe to say that in the world in which you and I live in today that several of those things are in reference to, to sexuality. I think sex is the, is the new God in the world that we live in. It certainly seems to be the new God in America. Everything is sexualized and driven that way. And of course, pornography rules the day and, and ruins people's lives. And every chance I get, I, I want to say this. I, I don't know how to talk to women about it, but men, let's pretend there's no women here right now. You can buy books as long as you're armed. There's, they're out there. Libraries are filled, I think, of books uh, regarding men and avoiding pornography, uh, avoiding pornography. And I'm not knocking that. Those are probably some tremendous books. But I'm going to tell you right now, guys, and if this applies to women, uh, then this truth is, is applicable to you too. And it is this. 
You can have all kinds of things on your phone. You can have all kinds of guards and apps and passcodes and all that stuff. And maybe you have to have that. That's fantastic. But the greatest way, I'm telling you right now, the greatest way to defeat that temptation is to literally, literally crawl if you have to, scrap if you have to, but get to the love of God. Listen, love God more than what the world has to offer. You can have all the safety things in place, and if you've got to do it, do it. But the greatest thing of all is that you love God more. In fact, Samson's thing is all about that. Think about Samson. Everything was about women. He had the power of God, but there's a woman. First, thing, first word out of his mouth in, in the book of Judges is Samson. I, I saw a woman. He says to his parents, give me that woman. That's a weird request from a kid to a parent, but the weird thing is, it wasn't until the end of his life that he saw the value and the power of loving God more. You can save yourself a lot of grief by not walking in the flesh, but walking in the spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's what I told that young man at the store. Don't do Christianity. Don't do it. Get into God's word and let the Holy Spirit do it through you. And that's the greatest power of the message of the cross in Christ, is that God does this. And when you realize, wait a minute, you know, I, all these sins that are punching me in the face and coming after me, and I, wait a minute, love God more and watch that stuff diminish and it vanishes away. You'll still be tempted by some other things, but those big mountains, God's grace can be shouted to it. And it's absolutely awesome. If, listen, if God didn't grant that power, I'd quit this job, this calling today. Because that victory happened in my life over 45 years ago. Where that was my life. That was my previous life. And God in his power came in and he showed me right up front. Because if you're all alone and you're away and you're, there's nobody around and it's just you. You know what will keep you? Loving God more. The love of God. That's why you read a moment ago that there's no law that can keep you from that. You're freed from the law when you walk in the Spirit. The law is guidelines, and that's fantastic. But the Spirit of God transcends that in your life. Absolutely awesome. And then we saw that serving the Holy Spirit, serving by the Holy Spirit to the glory of God matters. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5 there the scripture says, for John truly baptized with water, Jesus said, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons, brethren, which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse 8 is the punchline. But you shall receive power. Notice this. He's not talking about salvation. He's not talking about ordination. He's not talking about vision. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And I love this. And to the ends of the earth. Serving by the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, Zechariah 4 verse 6. If you want to see it in Hebrew, it's out there in the foyer. When you leave tonight and you go out the foyer... On that great Jerusalem stone is a seven lampstand menorah coming out of that stone. And in Hebrew, it says this very verse. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power. That's not human might, and that's not human power. But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's how God gets things done, is that his Holy Spirit working in and through your life does it. And the more you give up, and the more you see your weakness, the more God wants to use you. What an amazing kingdom we've been called to. God doesn't bring all these heavy lifters in and say, oh yeah, I'm going to use her and I'm going to use him. And they're super strong believers. They're super saints. This one prays 10 hours a day. And this one leads five people a day to Christ. And this one, are you hearing me? He doesn't do that. The man that's on the corner that beats his arm or his hand against his chest and says, be merciful to me, Lord, a sinner. Jesus said, is the man that goes away justified before God. The man that can't do anything. 
Paul the apostle who says, I'm the chief of sinners. Paul said that. Paul's the one that also said, I can do all things through Christ. Why did he say that? Because Paul was aware that he couldn't do anything without Christ. We revel in our weaknesses. God comes in and takes control. It's awesome, wonderful. We saw this last time, that we as believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. I love this. Sealed. Ephesians 4, verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. That word sealed, listen to this. It means to set the seal upon, and the object is, in this case, you. So if you're, listen, if you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you believe he died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead, and you've come to him, the Bible says you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Listen, it means to mark on or to identify as belonging to. I love that. In my little cartoon brain, I see a lot of my toys growing up because I would write my name on my toys. And I love the fact that God has inscribed, as it were, his name upon you as a believer by the Holy Spirit sealing you. Some of you need to embrace this and get excited about it because sometimes you're so terrorized by doubt and fear. The Holy Spirit has sealed you. The word means that he has made you. This sounds, this sounds kind of carnal in a sense, but the word is asset. He has sealed you as a, as a material asset. Those of you who own companies, for example, there's, there's, there's equipment that you have that have, have an, uh, an asset label on it. It's got a number on it. And it's got a label that, I mean, you can't take that thing off. And it's inventoried and the company knows it. And you have this asset mark on that item. Well, God puts an asset mark on you. This child is owned by me, God says. This child is my family. My Holy Spirit is upon them. And he has sealed you into the day of redemption. The word means to be secured, specifically against satanic and demonic powers. And I like one author said that the word seal here can also be translated sealed to conceal. Amen. And I love that. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of Christ and my redemption. But my previous life out of Christ, right? My BC days before Christ, that world is concealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. He not only seals you, but he takes your past and he removes it away. And you need to remember that. And then we're taught by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, we saw this in 1 John, that we have an anointing by the Holy Spirit. He teaches us. He's our teacher. And then tonight is where we're going to end with this final push. And that is, regarding theology and me, is that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit as believers. And from this argument, I'm going to fan out into a couple things that I hope uh, is a comfort to you. When I talk about indwelt by the Holy Spirit... I'm talking about the indwelling, the coming in of the Holy Spirit. Uh, some would say it's, listen, it's the baptism experience of the Holy Spirit. I want to be careful, everybody, how I say this. This is very technical. There is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, listen, which happens once in the believer's life, only once. Listen carefully. The baptism of of the Holy Spirit means this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to take the new believer at that moment and he baptizes, the Holy Spirit does the baptizing and he places you into the body of Christ. Y'all get that? Listen, I'll give you some uh, verses here in a moment. You say, wait a minute, I heard it the other way. Just wait, I'm not done. The Bible teaches that the moment you come to faith in Christ... You become a member of the body of Christ. You get that. It's called the church. We're all one. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit takes you and he baptizes you. He immerses you. Baptizo is the word and it means to be completely submerged. How do we baptize people here? We hold them down. No, we hold them under. And if you've ever been to one of our baptisms down at the beach, uh, some guys to me, some guys look more gnarly than most. I'll hold them down extra long. It's true. 
And I, but I always tell them, I'll tell them, um, they don't know, the family doesn't know, they're all looking on, and I'll tell them, look, don't worry, I'm going to hold you down a long time. No, I t- sometimes if the, if the woman looks gnarly, I'll do the same, I'll just hold her down. And uh, it's kind of cool, though, because when you bring, when you bring them up, the, the people on the shore, they just go, yeah, oh, that's great. I don't know if they're happy that they got their friend back from the dead or, or they're just celebrating the moment. But the fact is that the Holy Spirit takes your life and he puts you inside of Christ. Listen, we need to create a new, a new talk in our age. When I was a Christian in the 70s, there were things like, there were, there, were the, there were the one way, I saw some of you tonight, by the way, with the one way sign, one way Jesus. I saw you worshiping like this. That's awesome. I understood what you meant by that. I grew up in that generation. Uh, then there were things like, praise the Lord. That was, praise the Lord. And there were stickers and t-shirts, praise the Lord. Um, and then Maranatha. Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. All that's, okay. And then it just goes on. And then people moved on to say, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a Christian. And then it's like everybody was a Christian. It's just like, really? So saying you're a Christian, I don't know that it even matters anymore. Or being born again. I'm born again. I'm born again. Now, you have to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. But people just drop the word, and it means nothing. You mention Christian, people go, yeah, yeah, whatever. You mention born again, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's, it's been lost. But I tell you what a, a good code word is in this day and age. So far, only a believer would know it. And that is exactly what we're talking about, that the Holy Spirit places you into the body of Christ. And the Bible says that we as believers, listen, we need to be found in Christ. In Christ. Do a word search later on and find out how many times in the New Testament does the scripture say in Christ. And you're going to find a wonderful pattern. It's spoken only of believers Only those who are going to heaven. You need to ask yourself, are you in Christ? If you're in Christ, guess what? The Holy Spirit has baptized you in Christ. And you're in the family of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one and as many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, notice capital S, We all were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. That's the church. Isn't that powerful? And then we talk about the baptism, or we could say the filling of the Holy Spirit, that experience. This is the baptism, some will say, that Jesus Christ performs for the benefit of the Christian. Listen, the Holy Spirit baptizes you in the body of Christ, but listen, after you're saved, the Bible, and we'll see here in a moment, the Bible will often talk about you being baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. What is that? Listen, this is the baptism of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit upon you. Notice, the Holy Spirit takes you at salvation and places you into the body of Christ But regarding our empowerment, the Bible teaches us that it's Jesus who puts the Holy Spirit upon the believer for witness, for ministry, for power. One baptism happens once into the body of Christ. In other words, you're born again once. You don't have to get saved next Sunday. Did you get saved this last Sunday? You got saved. Yeah, but I had a rough week. I need to get saved again. (laughs) That's not how it works, friends. But as a Christian in life, we seek for his filling all the time. I'm going to give you a a bunch of verses right now if you'd write them down. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came down the first time ever in the New Testament church. And the church was born. And he came upon the believers. They were born again. 
but they didn't have the Holy Spirit's power upon them. Now, Acts 2 is unique because he not only came upon them, but he came uh, inside of them. This was the beginning, the birth of the church. Acts 4, verse 31. And when they had all prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I love that. It doesn't matter to me if you speak, the, if you speak in tongues. The important thing is, according to the Bible, you speak in tongues, it has to be interpreted so that everybody can understand what it was you just said. That's the gathering of believers. Is it a manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes, but it's not the only manifestation. I love this one we just read in Acts 4.31. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with boldness. Do we not need that today? Where's the church and its boldness? We need to be so radically dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Joe, I'm so weak, I'm so weak. Great, listen. Let him be strong in you. Tell him, I'm weak, I need your strength, God. And listen, he'll give you his strength if you plan on doing something with him. You tell him, Lord, use me. And he'll use you. He, he used a donkey. He used Balaam's donkey. He uses this jack right here. Right? Just be willing. Just be willing. We have so many great pastor teachers on staff. I tell you, we got guys that can just, there's some of the best teachers around. And here's the thing. I'm blown away because they, they open their mouth and it's golden. But I happen to be called right now to be the pastor here at this church. And I got to tell you, it's by God's grace. Because I can barely put two sentences together outside of this pulpit. God is so generous. But I revel in my weakness. Jack, do you get scared before you speak to people? Like I want to throw up. <laughs> you know butterflies, is that what you call them? Do you, think, do you think I don't have them? I have them all the time. Whenever I'm getting ready, to, you got to do a Wednesday night. You got to do Sundays three times. You got to speak. Are you going to go speak at this thing and the other? I'm sick. I'm sick to my stomach. You don't look like it. Because after all the years, you realize, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live. I'll make it. I'll survive. I may be a total fool when I'm done, but I'll make it. And you just get used to it. I asked Chuck Smith. Bef listen, before Pastor Chuck Smith died, a couple of years out before he died, I said, Pastor Chuck, I'm still always so nervous. I'm so nervous all the time. I'm so nervous. Are you ever nervous? Yep. Oh, yes. I go, you don't look nervous. He goes, I've learned how to deal with it. I just couldn't believe he was nervous. You ever see Greg Laurie before he preaches? He's nervous. You said, no way. I've seen him before a crusade in the dugout at Anaheim Stadium. He's nervous. <laughs> but when he gets up there, the power of God comes upon him. Yeah. Listen, get involved in the call ministry. Learn how to give the gospel, and you'll be terrified. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, sign up. It'll scare the snot out of you. <laughs> Do it. And you know what? We'll teach you how to give the gospel. It'd be amazing. It's foolproof. It's amazing. It's awesome. You'll be so equipped. And, we'll, and teams will take you and, you and we'll go door to door. And then it's your day. It's your, and you're like this. <laughs> you're, you're losing it. And your friends are behind you and it's your moment. And they open the door and you'll go. And you know what happens? Holy Spirit takes over. And you're like, you're like going and you're, all your training's coming out. And you're like, oh my goodness, what's happening here? Look at this. <laughs> And you're, tell, you're giving them the gospel and, the, and power. And then you come to the moment where would you like to accept Christ? And they'll go, yes. And you go, you do? You will? <laughs> Why? Because God's power did it. It's not of you. It's awesome. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, and while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that is the Jews, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. Uh, Luke 11, I, we read it last week. I'm going to skip it for time's sake. It's simply this. Jesus said, ask, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? Listen, 
this filling experience of his power. Ephesians 5, 17 says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You want to know what God's will is? Here it is. Do not be drunk with wine. Why? Because it doesn't last. Honestly, look, in which is dissipation. God says, why, why get drunk? You turn into an idiot, you make bad decisions. And then the influence of the wine is so brief that it leaks out. Why waste your time? Why give yourself to the power of something else that won't even do you good? See, you could set up rules. Thou shalt not drink. And people go, whoa, whoa, that's a bummer. And as soon as you tell somebody, don't drink, then they go, I never drank before, but now that you said don't do it, now I want to. <laughs> you know, that's how we are. We have no problem walking on the sidewalk until somebody puts a sign that says, don't walk on the grass. And then now it's like, you're not going to tell me what to do. <laughs> now you want to walk on the grass. Listen, the, the Bible is God's communication to us that he loves us. And Father knows best. He really does. So he says, why waste your time? Think about that. He says, but, and the word in Greek is this, but be being continuous, active. Be, this is to you, the believer, be being filled with the Spirit. Isn't that cool? Speaking to yourself, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make a melody in your heart to the Lord. You know what? So what does that mean? Probably the best thing is to just tell you about this evening. Did you see the sunset? Okay, if you didn't see the sunset, then you're probably vision impaired. I get that. How, did you, how could you miss it? I was inside the house, and I looked out the window, and my, the grass was pink. The trees were pink. The fence was pink. And I said, Lisa, I did. I said, Lisa, get out here. <laughs> we went outside and stood. We looked like a bunch of lemmings or whatever. We're like this. <laughs> like the claw. We were like. <laughs> it was amazing. Did you see it? Look, look. Maui is famous for sunsets. Tonight, I'm telling you. Maui wish it had a sunset like this tonight. Say, so what does that have to do with anything? That's exactly what we're talking about here. When the Spirit of God is controlling you and you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to have God's perspective of things. That's why you can be in the midst of this nation right now that's going through, this world. You can be in the midst of a COVID craziness and have a song in your heart. You can, you can have a melody. You can be praising God. You can thank him in the midst of all this insanity. Absolutely awesome. Got so excited, I lost my place. John 7, verse 37. Jesus said there, but the Bible tells us, first of all, that on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified or resurrected from the dead. What an awesome promise. Hey, you want to have an awesome life? Jesus said, drink of the Spirit. And out of your innermost being, down deep inside, the real person of who you are will be transformed and life will come out of you. Does this sound good to you? Life will come out of you. God does that. What about salvation? 2 Corinthians 1.22. We're almost done. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, He who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, in our hearts as a guarantee. I love that verse. Look at that verse. The Holy Spirit is inside your heart as a guarantee, a deposit given to you by God. Man, that's awesome. Amen. 
Is that true in your life? Has that happened to you? God wants it to happen to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans 8, 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. See, that's a statement of fact. Don't raise your hand, but are you born again? Yes, I am. Then the spirit of God is in you. That means you're not in the flesh. In fact, it means if you try to get in the flesh, you'll, you'll, you're, you can't even get in the flesh good. You'll mess up. A born-again believer with the spirit of God in them really stinks at sinning like they used to. They don't sin good anymore. They're miserable. They hate it. They fumble. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's inside of you saying, what are you doing? I don't want to be here. Let's go. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. That's pretty clear. Galatians 3, verse 2 says, This only, Paul said, I I want to learn from you, the church at Galatia. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Church, which one do you think it is? Do you go to heaven by uh, the law or by faith? faith? By faith. And then here's the evidence. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. You know what he means by that, right? The flesh talks, our flesh talks to us all the time. Let me encourage you. If you, you could be absolutely, totally filled with the Holy Spirit, born again believer, walking in the power of God. Do you understand something? The flesh still talks. That's why the Bible says another place in Romans that we have to crucify the flesh all the time. Okay? You know how you come to church? You come to church, you're praising the Lord. Oh my goodness, it's so great to be here. Humans, we're people. (laughs) We're together. God, you're amazing. And you're going like this, and you have this lame, horrible thought. Do you ever have that happen? And you go, I don't want that. I don't want that thought. That's a horrible thought. Oh, and then, listen, and the enemy, he'll wait a few minutes and then (laughs) shoot another one in your head. And then you start, by the time the last song's over, you're thinking, I think I'm going to hell. (laughs) I think I'm lost. How can I be here? I was loving God when I came in here and these thoughts have been hitting my head. That's because, listen, the enemy is attacking you. That's good news. Let him attack. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He's the devil. That's what he does. He's going to shoot. He's going to shoot. He's going to shoot at you. He's he's Satan. That's what he does. He's the best Satan there'll ever be. And his job is to shoot those thoughts at your head. That's why you're supposed to grab every thought and put it under the captivity of Christ. Bring it under his reign. It's very important to remember that. Verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. That's you, church. These are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba. That's Hebrew for father or dad. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Life in the Spirit. And I end here. In John 17, such a precious moment. It's actually known as the high priestly prayer of Christ. In John 17. Here's an excerpt from it. In John 17, verse 20, Jesus is praying to his father. And listen to this. He says, I do not pray for these alone. So he must have been, think about him gesturing. Father, he's talking to his father. And he must have had the disciples in view. Maybe it's even the disciples and others who had come to faith. And they're standing within his view. And he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me, listen, through their word. Wow. Isn't that amazing? The world is going to learn about me, Jesus is saying, because these right here are going to tell the next person they meet And then that person's going to tell somebody. And then that person's going to tell somebody until it gets to Chino Hills. 
Where were you when you heard for the first time? It's amazing. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Is that not precious? Do you want to cry? Is that not sweet? People tell me they don't believe in God and they don't need Jesus. You're rejecting that? What's wrong with you? Jesus, he didn't have to come here. He came here so that you would experience oneness with Almighty God. And not only oneness with Almighty God, Jesus said it's going to be just as equal as his oneness with his Father so they will have oneness with my Father. Can you believe that? You see why we're going to walk around eternity forever going, you're amazing, you're amazing, holy, 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 wow, almighty, this is incredible. (laughs) He said in verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. I don't even pretend to understand what that means. The glory that you gave me, I've given them. You know what that means? I think it means, you know when somebody says, hey, Junior, you know, when I die, I'm going to leave you my empire. You know, the kid's like 11 years old, picking his nose, sitting on his tricycle. He doesn't know what you're talking about. But the kid, he's like a, he's like a multimillionaire in waiting. Are you with me? He doesn't have a clue. He doesn't even have a hint that attorneys are in place and and, uh, all these mechanisms are in place. Listen, that when that guy dies, his death triggers all of this legal action to make that little punk a multimillionaire. He doesn't even know it. God set it all up. And no wonder why it's called the New Testament. We have last wills and testament when we die to transfer something to somebody else. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that he died on the cross and rose again from the dead is awesome but powerless unless he dies. Jesus Jesus had to die for it to be empowered. Everything that you experience and shall experience is all based upon the death of of the one who promised. He wrote you a will. But wills are powerless until somebody dies. And then he not only died, he empowered the will. Then three days later, he rose again from the dead to be your advocate to make sure the will that he left you doesn't get messed up by anybody so that it's truly applied to you forever. That's amazing. And I know I'm supposed to end three minutes ago. But here it is. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, and that they may be one just as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be made complete or perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. I love how that ends. The the world is going to find out that these Christians are loved by me. They're loved by you, Father, and they're loved by me, and you gave them to me. And they're in me, and I'm in them, and they are one with us. This is the gospel of God. Hallelujah for it. Thank God for it. I hope you're trusting him tonight. And part of trusting him tonight is allowing his Holy Spirit, can I put it this way? I I believe this, what I'm about to say. Allowing the Holy Spirit to possess your life. I love that. That's how I talk to him. Lord, possess me. If he possesses me, then it's going to be a good day. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. 
And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button, tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're gonna continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us, no pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.